Hello and welcome to the Shooting Outdoors channel. Back in 2016 when I was working away I came across an equestrian centre that was selling this Napier Power Pell Lube, this is just the card, the bottle's missing, for a pound a bottle. So I bought everything that they had. <laughs> <laughs> it said that independent tests prove that it can almost improve almost. your accuracy by 50%, well increase accuracy 50%. I'm assuming that's a barrel and not your own personal skills. <laughs> We looked at what else you can do with pellets because this gave me an idea. You can modify them with lube, what else can you modify them with? You can weigh them, you can sort them, size them, you can do quite a lot with them. We're going to put all these in a DOE in this series. We're going to try and make it as, as long as we can really because we're trying to focus on quality this year rather than quantity which we did last year which didn't really work. Well it did actually. But we want to see is this any good? Does it actually say what it, it does what it says on the tin? And more importantly what about the other factors? And then you've got the whole factor of, are they only gated anyway once you get outside into the open air and the wind starts blowing them down. So this is episode one, and in episode one we're going to look at how we prepared the pellets and how we start preparing the DOE. Sounds good. Alright then, enjoy. It. Prepping the pellets. Well, after a quick review through the SOC archives to review what pellets worked and didn't work in Big Arena, the S410, we decided that the pellet that would best suit the trials would be the JSB Exact 4.52mm. The reason for this is it gives a fairly average performance during the pellet trials, but was still manageable in my barrel at range. Therefore, the JSB Exacts should show a notable improvement in group size and not foul other groups as the accuracy is consistent enough. As you can see, this is a new tin, and the first task of the trial is to put a generous quantity of control pellets to one side. This is so we always have tin fresh samples if things go awry. All variations of pellets will be kept in money bags and within an airtight container. The second job is to weigh the pellets into 0 0.01 grain groups. This is very tedious, labouring, divorce level sort of task. This is really one of those jobs that's akin to ironing. It kind of has a point, sort of value adding, but nobody really wants to do it. I start this by just weighing the pellets and let the results drive the weight columns. After an hour or so, I end up with a couple of clear individual winner groups. Normally, the biggest will go into my competition tin and the trajectory map will be created to that weight. Resolution wise, 0.05 has always been okay to use to control the y axis of a group for hunting, I find. For competition though, has to be 0.01 of a grain, best it can be considering my equipment. For this set of tests though, we've straddled a 0.03 grain and we will use two weight ranges shown. The elevation of the group is not under scrutiny on this occasion, so potentially there could be a 5 grain split in the weight, but as long as the range of the pellets is within 0.03 of a grain, I'm happy. I'm going to wash one range now and I'm going to leave the other group unwashed. This is because I'm not going to sit in the field and try and find 30 pellets within 0.03 of a grain of each other if washing and weighing turn out to be key variables. The next job is also tedious but less lengthy and laborious. Sizing. This job is running the individual pellets through a die so the head diameter and skirt diameter become standardised. This means the blowout in the skirt, the friction along the barrel and through the choke is consistent to tighten the overall velocity split at the muzzle. It also acts as a choke itself in respect to sizing. The sizes come in different sizes, so you can match the die to the breech for that perfect interference fit between pellet and barrel, all for generally under £20. You can do this task as a whole tin, or just as and when you want, stroke need, the benefit that it offers. It can also reshape a damaged skirt if it's got a ding in it. Pellet set number four will be the Napier Power Pellet Lubed Pellets. These boast so many benefits on the packaging, it's going to win me the HFT World Championship next year without a doubt. But let's be realistic, it's a well endorsed and well marketed product. And do I think it's going to deliver? Kind of, 
but how much almost is as a delivery is the question. But what's the science behind the product then? Metal on metal creates a certain amount of friction. The idea of lubrication is to make a bearing in the form of microscopic modules, synthetic or mineral, to reduce this friction. So basically, lots of little balls you can't see allow the pellet to glide down the barrel, meaning a reduction in friction and a more consistent velocity at the muzzle. It also prevents rusting in the barrel and on the pellet. Now, I don't believe that there's enough oil on that there pellet to really work in such a way over a long distance. I think realistically it's only going to work in regards to the first inch or so as the pellet accelerates, but it may lay down more of a film over the lands of the length of the barrel over time. Effectively, the three ten shot groups should carry on getting tighter to a point where the barrel is well lubed and maximum consistency prevails. The downsides are the oil can go off and dry up. I mean just look under the oil pan or rocker cover on an engine for example. And It'll tend to gather lead stroke foreign debris in the rifling and throw off the accuracy over time. Now I believe that lubrication will speed up the process of accuracy loss rather than delay it. Any debris in the tin or around a lube pellet will stick to it which will hurt accuracy further. Too much oil in a pellet and we get dieseling where the lubricant ignites and fuels an extra power source which can send a standard 12 foot pound air gun into FAC land. But we can negate all these risks if it delivers what it says on the packet. Almost a 50% increase in accuracy. So the idea is to follow the instructions, which is three drops into the bag, add 50 pellets, in our case 30 pellets, and we'll massage them gently in the bag and that's it. But what if any old grot works? What about grotty three in one? So yes, we're running the same trial on 30 pellets that have been treated with the most general purpose oil on the market. This is one part of the test I can't wait to get into and chew the data. Naturally, the barrel will be cleaned and relined with control pellets for each of the lubes used. So we don't have issues with contaminants from pellet set to pellet set. These will therefore be shot last before I give the barrel a good mopping and clean to return it to pest control and competition duties. But now we're stuffing all these pellets into our airtight box. The last job is one that I like and actually swear by. I know this works and it's very cheap to do. Washing pellets. This is what I'd use to do it. And these can be all bought for under a tenner and or already in the house. Carefully tip your pellets into the container. Try to reduce the travel time for the pellets so as not to damage them. Get the water hot. Around 60 degrees is good. No kettles though. Add some car wash fluid to the container. I like turtle wax, but generally I'm using this free stuff I got a few years back currently. And fill the container half full of hot water. Fit the lid and agitate the pellets. As always, think about what you're doing. My hands can take 60 degree heat and have taken over 100 degrees of car tyre rubber at a gloveless pit stop. I didn't yelp, but it wasn't a comfortable 5 seconds. Your hands may be more sensitive to heat, so ensure you can take whatever heat you use. If not, glove it up. Regarding agitation, I like this method of rotation. Works for me. Some just like to swirl the water around. Literally, whatever's comfortable, people. You do need to agitate them, though. Don't worry about the seeping of water. This is steam pressure inside opening the lid. It will calm down within a minute or two. But I generally like to think that it's removing any of the major pellet debris from the container. Not all of it, but a fair bit. But why wash them? Well, manufacturing facilities like foundries are never clean places. They're also making thousands of pellets on a run. As the coatings are applied, some will stay on the surface that the pellet rests on. There will be ad hoc cleaning going on in some form that loosens this debris. Debris in the air, etc. and when the coatings are applied, well this debris will stick to the pellet loosely. Washing them removes a lot of this debris and reduces flies and improves the surface of the pellet's head, reducing separation in the airflow. This also extends back to the skirt where around 80% of the swarf is, stuck on the base of the skirt. After some agitation, remove the lid and tip them into the sieve. And again, less decanting distance for the pellet, the less risk there is of damaging them. This is also a good point to see how dirty your brand new pellets actually were. 
Also, give the workstation your container a good clean. Remember, humans and lead don't mix if we ingest it. This small amount probably is safe, but a daily ingestion is bad. This is my utility sink for boot washing and engine component cleaning, as is the dishwasher, but shh, Mrs. Adams don't know about that yet. Wash them off with the cold water. I manipulate the sieve rather than shake them about in it, but the odd rattle won't hurt too much. Now it's on to the kitchen towel and this Regina is really good absorbent stuff. Get a hold of some. I just roll the pellets to remove the bulk of the water. It'll only remove the bulk though, and there'll still be plenty of water in the skirts, and this can add nearly half a grain in the weight, and we need rid of it. To remedy this, preheat an oven to around 30 degrees, put the pellets in the towel into a baking tin, and gently place them into the oven. Come back in 40 minutes for perfectly dry, perfectly clean air gun pellets because this isn't just any old cleaning process, this is the SOC cleaning process. After that, leave them to cool down for 10 minutes, at which point wipe out the pellets in you're putting them into. No sense in putting clean pellets into a dirty gusting tin. Or if you lube them, add a few drops to the tin itself, ideally the makeup pad as this holds the lube and keep that tin as your cleaned pellet tin. Over time, you'll not need to lube anymore as the pad will become saturated with lube, but just remember to inspect for debris and restart with a new pad and clean it annually or as required, but not mandatory. Why not just drop the lube onto the pellets? Well, what can happen if you drop lube onto the pellets is it goes inside that skirt of the single pellet and stays there, and the benefit of oiling is lost with, quite simply, a single diesel pellet waste of a lube. Now we pick out 30 wash pellets for the trial and keep the rest in the lube tin for the Walther LGV. So all the variables are now prepped with individual variables to shoot three 10 shot groups of each. We're now ready to go shooting. So we've prepared all the pellets for the tests. It's a bit, so it might be a bit sucking eggs for you but you know you can see what we've done. Next episode we're going to be putting these pellets to the test collecting a load of data see what we get see you next time all the best stay safe shoot straight thanks for watching goodbye like share follow yes okay and stop then, walking away know, every time you f off and get up and walk away and it's like we've got to do good. episode two yet right all right episode so. two.